So I'm excited to, to talk about what's going on with Mosaic and what's going on more broadly in the residential solar industry, um, but also potentially get to some of the questions you've been thinking about for a decade as opposed to the ones you've been thinking about for, for a few years. As a reminder, just like in those other sessions, uh, we're going to take questions from you guys. I'm hoping to take some questions from, from you all throughout the session. So please go on to that site, gtm.cnf.io, ask questions, uh, upvote questions, uh, make sure that we, we get to the right ones. And I'll try to take those as they're, as they're coming in to the extent that we can. So Billy, welcome. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about the arc, the sort of historical arc of Mosaic as a, as a company, because you guys have gone through a couple of different phases um, in your growth. Originally started primarily doing crowdfunding for commercial solar, I guess, and then have sort of transitioned over time to being a residential solar loan provider. Can you talk about how that transition occurred, what led to it, and sort of how you relate those two things to each other? Sure. So. I'm a mission-driven entrepreneur. I uh, have been focused my whole career on how to accelerate the transition to 100% clean energy. How do we get as many people involved in that transition? And six years ago when we started Mosaic, we saw uh, a problem, uh, a lack of financing in the commercial solar market. So kind of small um, community commercial solar projects. And we thought we would solve that problem by also solving another problem, which was that people wanted to invest in solar, people who were renters or wanted to uh, you know, put their money behind solar. And uh, those, both of those are difficult problems, and they kind of compounded their difficulty. Mm. Uh, so for each commercial solar project, we were going out and doing custom contract negotiation, uh, custom underwriting. And then to do the crowdfunding, we had to describe all of those unique characteristics in prospectuses for state and federal securities mm -hmm. regulators. And so that just didn't scale. So uh, three years ago, uh, we looked at what we had built. We had built a, a strong brand, relationships with lots of installers, uh, a technology platform that uh, efficiently connected uh, you know, thousands of investors with dozens of, of borrowers. And we looked at the residential segment of the market and said, you know, we can actually leverage a lot of what we've built to solve some problems in the residential segment of the market. And the problems we saw there were, uh, uh, while the lease or PPA product had brought solar into the mainstream, there was no 20-year loan product mm -hmm. that matched that value proposition for a customer that's looking to save money on a monthly basis by going solar. Uh, and there was no technology-driven finance company in the space mm -hmm. that uh, both offered a, a simple financing solution, uh, but did so efficiently and, and could really connect and, uh, into the software systems that installers were using. Right, so I want to come back to the, the technology-driven uh, solar finance company and sort of what that, what that really means in a minute. But before we depart entirely from the original Mosaic business model, I'm curious, now in retrospect with some, some light behind you, how you feel about crowdfunding as a mechanism to uh, finance solar. Crowdfunding in general seems like, first of all, there's a little bit of it going on still in solar. It seems to be the companies that are doing it more with institutional investors and things like that. Um, and more generally, the crowdfunding space, I think, has lost a little bit of its luster. Certainly the public companies like Lending Club having some, some trouble. So, you know, do you still think that, that at some point crowdfunding is a, a mechanism to finance a lot of solar, or do you think it's just too hard? Uh, I do. Uh, I, I think it will come back at some point, but the other thing that made the business model unscalable was that even though Congress passed the JOBS Act, which was supposed to unlock crowdfunding, mm -hmm. President Obama signed it into law, the SEC still hasn't implemented it. Right. So this is five years after they passed the law. Uh, so you know, the regulatory environment is still unclear. And you know, we met with the SEC, and they basically said, unless you follow the exact fact pattern of Lending Club and Prosper, there's not a, a federal pathway for you to continue doing crowdfunding or to scale it beyond a variety of state exemptions and 
you know, working only with accredited investors or high net worth individuals. Right. And you know, what we wanted to do was to make it possible for people in all 50 states, regardless of whether they're super wealthy or not, to participate. And there is still not a pathway mm. to do that. So I, I sort of wonder whether ultimately, assuming the SEC gets its act together and implements the Jobs Act and the regulatory question doesn't become the primary hurdle, whether you ultimately have sort of competition between uh, community solar and crowdfunding, right? Both of which are sort of mechanisms to allow somebody who couldn't put solar on their roof otherwise to invest in solar. So maybe community solar ends up being the solution to that problem. No, I think that's right. And we, we were, when we were starting, we, we looked at community solar uh, and, and we thought, you know, it's just too utility dependent and, mm -hmm. and we couldn't risk starting the business based on needing to be able to work with the utilities on it. We needed or we, we thought the better path was to start something where we could kind of control our own destiny, destiny a little bit more. Um, but I do think community solar could take that place. Uh, but if you, if you just look at where the, the wealth is in the world, you know, you look at different pockets from sovereign wealth funds to, you know, pension funds, insurance company, banks, uh, by far uh, the biggest segment of wealth is still controlled by regular people. Mm. And if we can figure out how to tap into that pool of capital, uh, I think it you know, could provide significant additional financing. And, and this was part of our desire with crowdfunding, it could deepen the base of support for solar. You know, if you right. have millions of people who are investing in solar uh, you know, through community solar or crowdfunding or by buying a solar installation and putting it on their roof, those are uh, uh, activated solar uh, 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 advocates who right. I think will help to accelerate the policy uh, solutions that we need to further accelerate the transition. Great, so, uh, so you guys then make this pivot, you end up doing residential solar loan financing um, and you're going along and growing and uh, starting to raise funds that had pretty big numbers. I think in April of this year, you announced a, a, something like a $200 million project fund. And then perhaps most surprisingly, at least from my perspective, then in August, you announce a t up to $220 million equity raise, as I understand it, from, from Warburg Pincus uh, with participation from a couple of others. So that's a, kind of an eye-poppingly large number for as you described it, like a technology-driven finance company. So why, why so much money? What are you going to do with that? Yeah. Uh, so the first reason we did it was uh, ballast. Hmm. You know, it, it feels like these are, uh, you know, I'm very bullish on the future, but um, it feels like these are, uh, you know, we're navigating choppy waters. and. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we had an equity capital base sufficient to, uh, to confidently grow. Mm. Um, and the other thing that it does for us is historically we have been selling all of the loans we originated to third parties, banks, insurance companies, et cetera. And with this new capital raise, we can now lend on our own balance sheet. And uh, that's really powerful. Uh, it's so a, that's it's, in lieu of a project fund, or it sits on, in the back end? In other words, do you take that $200 million fund that you raise to finance projects, those, you provide the loans with that capital, but then you retain the project yourself and pay it out yourself? That's right. And so then you end up with a bunch of projects on your balance sheet, which presumably then you do something with at some point, or you own for the long term. So you want it to be an asset owner of a sort. That's right. And why, why does that provide a benefit, apart from just sort of stacking margin? Yeah, so you know, back to the marketplace lending uh, question you were, or that you were talking about earlier, uh, it's important for, uh, for lenders, for investors, to see an originator like Mosaic that's you know, uh, originating loans, um, uh, you know, eating our own cooking. Hmm. We're not just making loans and then selling them. Uh, we like the assets we're originating. We're holding them on our balance sheet. So uh, it gives confidence to investors in the asset. Uh, it also creates diversification. So we're not completely reliant on other investors uh, buying all of what we're originating. We have capacity to, to hold all of it if we want mm -hmm. on our balance sheet. So you know, if 
for a variety of reasons those markets dry up, we can continue to lend. So you know, that's the most important thing for us, to have a strong equity capital base and to be able to lend through market cycles, which this enables us to do. Right. So you mentioned being a technology-driven organization. What, what does that actually look like? What technology are you having to build and how does that make a difference versus another source of financing that doesn't have the same technological base? Yeah. So uh, for us, it uh, is about meeting the, our installer partners where they are. Um, so for some, they have their own CRMs, software solutions, their own quoting tools, things like that. And they just need a couple things from us to very neatly, seamlessly fit into their existing mm -hmm. flows. For other installers, they want a lot of that from us. They want quoting tools uh, and other things. So, you know, we have customized solutions that we offer to, uh, to all of our different installer partners that, you know, at the, bo at, at the end of the day, help them close customers more efficiently. That's what it comes down to, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, our partners experience better conversion rates because they work with Mosaic, because we help them develop, uh, uh, you know, streamlined processes. So you mentioned your partners, and, and I think uh, it's an interesting time to be Asking this question, you've obviously built your business off of the, the partner model, right? The model where you are providing financing to installers. You are not an installer yourselves. You're not vertically integrated. And, uh, right. you know, I think that's sort of coming back into vogue again now, where there was a few years where it seemed like vertical integration was the direction the market was heading. Um, either this is the last of the, the waves or it's cyclical and we'll go back the other direction in a bit. But talk a little bit about why... Why work with installer partners and not be an installer? Yeah, uh, you know, there's been uh, a lot of conversation around, you know, loans and leases and, and, and that transition. Um, but I think one of the other big uh, undercurrents has been this vertical integration versus, uh, you know, a distributed networked uh, 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 ecosystem. And, you know, our belief is that the, the market will move towards that. Uh, and, and that, um, you know, as in other home improvement uh, 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 categories like, you know, windows and doors, HVAC, um, uh, and, and other efficiency um, uh, markets, you see a highly disaggregated uh, uh, market with lots of, you know, local, regional contractors mm -hmm. that uh, have built up a base of customers, uh, are efficient at marketing in those uh, local areas, are high quality installers, and you know, we're really proud to not compete with our partners for customers uh, and really uh, just support them in running their businesses more efficiently. There's a, there's a question from the audience uh, that's popping up here that relates to something you just mentioned, sort of that you mentioned that they're quality installers, and I guess this is always a question. If you're, the, you're providing financing, so uh, you or your, your finance provider is on the hook for the performance of the asset to some extent, um, certainly less so than you would be with a, a PPA, but still on the hook that this thing works. Um, and you're working with a network of small local installers. How do you ensure, what's quality control look like there, and yeah. how hard is that? That's a great question, and um, you know, it's something that uh, you know, we've always been focused on, but, uh, and to the point about holding the loans on our balance sheet, mm -hmm. we're, you know, even more focused right. on it now because uh, losses in the portfolio we directly take. So, um, you know, this is something when we started, we didn't have a whole lot of data to work with. We didn't know what drove delinquencies. Um, we, we didn't know, you know, where the bodies were buried, mm -hmm. so to speak. So, um, We've hired a bunch of people uh, uh, who have a lot of experience in the industry, and we now work with a very large, uh, uh, you know, we have 250 installers we work with that represent the majority of the market and uh, have been running the program for two and a half years. So we, we, we know what works. We have a lot of data and are, uh, are sharing that data uh, with our partners to help them, uh, uh, again, run their businesses more efficiently and to kind of create some guardrails to 
uh, make sure that they're using best practices when they're communicating with the customer about the loan, uh, you know, so that they can understand how their pull-through rates compared to pull-through rates of others, mm -hmm. um, and a whole variety of things that relate to having a high-quality uh, uh, customer experience at the at the end of the day. So, so all that data that you have uh, is allowing you to start to get a glimpse into where the bodies may ultimately be buried. Like where? I mean, where, where, what worries you in these installations? What are, you, what are you looking out for? Yeah. So, you know, one of the biggest things we're focused on is, uh, is what expectations are set with the consumer. Mm. So, you know, and, and uh, some companies, particularly if they're in a growth mode, they're trying to hit targets. Um, and or there are just poorly trained sales reps um, who, uh, you know, don't mention that uh, 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 there's a component of the loan where, uh, you know, uh, there's a principal repayment after 18 months, and they just don't bring that up at mm -hmm. all. And so that creates an expectation, the wrong expectation with the customer that they can keep their tax credit, keep the low payments. Um, uh, so that's something that we've been focused on. Um, what about um, explaining to the customer about the, the risk of rate structure changes or even the, I mean, in California, which is a lot of the business for you guys and everybody else, uh, pending time of use rates yeah. is something that we've heard anecdotally makes it a little bit more difficult to sell solar to the customer because you have to sort of explain to them, well, all right, in a couple of years, here's probably what's going to happen to you, and we think it'll be better, but it would be even better if you would shift your load like this, and it just complicates that process. Yeah. So how much of that are you obligated as an installer to tell the customer in the sales process? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and, and it gets to a broader point around, uh, uh, you know, one of our probably our, our, our highest print design principle is simplicity, that uh, we, we, think, uh, we think people have overcomplicated the sales process, and so mm. we're always trying to work with our partners to help them simplify down to you know, the essentials of what needs to be communicated. And there are some things from a disclosure perspective that, uh, again, are sort of automated in our process to make sure that they get communicated to, to the customer. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I would say on the time of use rates, this is something we're in dialogue with our partners now about, about how to best communicate around, around that, because it is really complex and right. it sure is not going to uh, uh, streamline the sales process. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that it's an, it's an interesting general question about sort of where the, the future of residential solar heads, which is that in a lot of places we're headed toward uh, Compensation mechanisms, rate structures, net energy metering alternatives or versions that you know make a lot of sense conceptually and are pretty complex in reality. And the thing that maybe we're not always taking into account is that that makes it a lot harder then to, to sell to the customer. I mean, are you selling them on this guaranteed savings idea, and you know, are they actually going to achieve that? Right. Um, which it, which is probably long-term beneficial to an ownership model where you're not so tied to right you know future performance certainly beneficial from from your perspective from the customer perspective it, it puts them on the hook just as much as anybody else right well if they if they've got you know uh, a PPA with an escalator and you don't know where rate structures are going I'd right. say that's worse than hmm. locking in your your payments right um, there's a the question here that has the, the, the highest votes is a softball to you, so I don't want to ask it, but I'm going to anyway. Why do you think Mosaic has been able to raise capital when other resi solar market participants have not? First of all, I'm not sure that's necessarily, I just want to reframe that, not necessarily true. Lots of companies, pretty much all of them, continue to raise capital. Um, though Mosaic has found both ways to raise it from new players, uh, which is interesting, I think, and... Uh, ways to raise more and more of it, which is not something you can say for everyone. Yeah. So what's behind that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll make a little plug for our new equity sponsor, Warburg Pincus, who I didn't know a lot about before the process, but, you know, they're the oldest private equity firm um, in the world. Uh, they have the largest growth equity fund of any private equity fund. Mm -hmm. um, they back energy, financial services, and technology companies, which are kind of the three areas that, that we represent. And they, uh, 
they took a deep look at the market. They talked to over 100 installers. They talked to all the major uh, banks um, and, and came to a view that, one, the market is growing, so it's a good market to be operating in, uh, and that, um, you know, particularly from a kind of team and technology perspective, that, that we were well positioned to continue to uh, maintain a leadership leadership position in the market. So I think a lot of it comes down to team and technology platform mm -hmm. uh, that, um, uh, you know, we've got a really special uh, culture at Mosaic that is, uh, you know, very mission driven, uh, highly collaborative, um, uh, customer focused, uh, and with a design orientation around, you know, simple, integrated, powerful technology solutions to help contractors run their businesses more effectively and uh, you know the combination of those two things I think is, has allowed us to raise capital and then that's a, a, a virtuous cycle right all right so enough with the, the softball so uh, what you know the residential solar market is growing slower this year than it did in previous years less so for the long tail of smaller installers with whom you work than it has been for the major installers um, albeit still true for them they're not growing quite as fast as they have been in the past. To what do you attribute that generally, and, and do you think that this is the new normal, or are we experiencing a blip that, that comes back? Yeah, so I think some of it relates to the last question where it has been harder to raise capital mm -hmm. uh, in this space. Um, you know, uh, Sun Edison's bankruptcy was a part of that. Um, you know, just volatility, uh, low, you know, low commodity prices, a whole range of factors have just made it harder to raise both debt and equity in mm -hmm. the space, uh, which has impacted not only, uh, you know, has impacted the largest companies the most, but, you know, a lot of the, you know, local regional uh, installers we work with have also had a harder time raising the capital they need to continue to grow. And that seems to be changing. We, mm -hmm. We've seen, uh, um, uh, uh, the capital raising open up a little bit over the last quarter or so, and I think that will continue to improve. I think actually uh, uh, capital markets have been pricing in uh, uncertainty around the elections. Hmm. I, I think um, you know there, there uh, still is, although it it's, seems less, less likely now, a, a path where you know, we could have a, a, a less favorable policy environment. And, uh, and I think some of that is psychological and, yeah. and, and subconscious, but um, you know, I, I, think, I think we will soon have a, a new president who has a goal to take us from 35 gigawatts installed today to 140 gigawatts by 2020. Uh, and I think we're gonna go through a very uh, another big solar boom. Mm -hmm. um, final question for you relates to something we were talking about before, and it's in one of these audience questions. I sort of wanted to ask it as well, so I'll try to combine it all, which is it has to do with sort of consumer protection. This is, uh, this is going to become an issue the federal government will have to deal with. Actually, the next president will have a role to play here because the FTC has uh, held a hearing earlier this year about consumer protection in, in rooftop solar. Um, and how to make sure that, that consumers know what they're signing up for. One of the questions here is what limits do you impose on installers' sales proposals about things like what they tell the customer about annual utility rate increases? So how are you thinking about as you're working through this network, what do you tell your installer partners to make sure that the consumer is protected when they make a decision like going solar? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and, and it's something we're really focused on. I, I had dinner with the, the head of the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, on, uh, on Sunday night. And you know, we're talking with them about what are best practices in, in the industry, um, how to understand the space. And you know, we work, our legal team works very closely with all of our partners uh, to uh, vet all of their marketing materials to make sure that there are no claims in there that, uh, uh, that we think create consumer uh, uh, protection issues. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as importantly, uh, we control uh, uh, the process to make sure that certain disclosures and other things are clearly communicated to the customer during the process that um, you know, we can't control you know, everything that a sales rep says 
um, but we do training, we have certification uh, that they need to get, uh, we review all of their marketing materials, and we control the critical part of the, the customer uh, credit application and approval uh, and loan document signing process to ensure that that is in compliance. Great. Uh, well, that is all the time that we have this morning. Unfortunately, we're headed straight into another panel right after this that actually dovetails well on our question about time of use rates because it's all about the new normal in, in California solar. So stick around two more sessions before lunch. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking Billy. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>